I'm going to help you understand your pelvic floor at a level that you've probably never heard before. And I'm going to give you exercises that you've also probably never tried that will help resolve a lot of common pelvic floor issues like pain and incontinence. Here's your first food for thought. You know how you have a diaphragm within your rib cage? Well, your pelvic floor is essentially the diaphragm of your pelvis. And issues with the pelvic floor are oftentimes a result of poor pressure management strategies within the pelvis itself. What I'm trying to get at here is that the pelvic floor acts very similarly to the diaphragm within our rib cage, meaning that it can be in more or less two positions. It can be in a descended position or it can be in an ascended position. This can and does change every breath that we take and it should work synchronously with our diaphragm in our rib cage. So when I inhale, you should see the diaphragm in the rib cage drop down. You see the same thing within the pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor. It drops down as we inhale. As we exhale, it ascends at both the pelvic diaphragm and the thoracic diaphragm. Now, the issue we run into is that many times a pelvic floor that is experiencing some issues usually has a part of it or multiple parts that are stuck in either a descended or ascended position. And I'm gonna help you figure out how that is. Many times when people are experiencing issues with their pelvic floor or they feel that they have a tight pelvic floor, oftentimes what they're experiencing is tightness of the pelvic floor, at least on the backside. Now you can split your pelvic floor up into four different quadrants. So you have two in the front and two in the back. This is a little reductionist, but it's gonna help drive the point home. Now different sections of this pelvic floor can be in either a tight or loose position. If the pelvic floor in one area is in a tight position, that means that tissues are in a shortened position. If the pelvic floor is in a loose position, then tissues in that area, muscles in that area are going to be in a more elongated position relative to the tighter ones. When someone experiences issues with their pelvic floor, in many, many cases, they oftentimes experience tightness. And that tightness is often the result of the pelvic floor that's actually too descended, meaning that it is in a position where it's dropped in the back. So tissues on the back half of the pelvis are in a shortened position. So this is actually putting the pelvis in a position where we are in an externally rotated environment. When my pelvis externally rotates, it does this. When it internally rotates, it does that. So stuff on the back half of the pelvic floor is going to stretch out when we go into internal rotation. Stuff on the back half is going to shorten as we go into external rotation. And that feeds down into our femurs too. Now I'm gonna give you one more layer and this is the key, so bear with me here. The orientation as a whole of our pelvis has a massive influence on the ability for us to manage pressure properly within our pelvis. So if my pelvis is now forward into, let's say, an anterior pelvic tilt, that is going to change where pressure goes. And that is going to throw off the relationship between my pelvic floor, my pelvic diaphragm, and my upper body's diaphragm, my thoracic diaphragm. Let me show you what I mean. So what should typically happen when we inhale is our diaphragm should descend. Our ribs should inflate in all directions. And we should also have the pelvic floor descend as well. As we exhale, you're going to see the pelvic floor ascend. You're going to see the diaphragm ascend and this should happen synchronously. This is pressure management and this can only properly happen in the most optimal environment when we have the rib cage stacked over the pelvis. If we now then, let's say, move into that flared anterior pelvic tilt position like this, which increases our low back arch, now when we breathe in, the diaphragm is compromised in its position to do that. Let me give you an example using incontinence. When we're stuck in this position, now the diaphragms can't align and they can't be stacked on top of each other and things get thrown off. Now the pelvic diaphragm is no longer stacked below the thoracic diaphragm, so it's not going to be able to properly get things to sink down into it either. So we're stuck here in this flared position, like many people are, if pressure's only going forward and down, that is going to put pressure on my pelvic floor forward and down. And think about the implications of that. If we have pressure being pushed onto our bladder and our urethra, which is forward and down, the thing that's missing here is the ability to get that full nice exhale and get the ascended position of the pelvic floor and the thoracic diaphragm so that we can reachieve a nice stack. 
But what's happening is that pressure is thrown off now. We have a compromised relationship between our rib cage and our pelvis. Imagine your body is being represented by this paper towel roll right here. Now, if I press down on it, pressure is evenly distributed because this thing is stacked on top of itself from top to bottom. Imagine this is your actual diaphragm to your pelvic floor right here. But if I extend the system and bend it and I apply additional compressive forces, now this thing is going to bend and break at the path of least resistance. So basically it can't handle the pressure of those external forces nearly as well. Now many people can't get full ascension of the pelvic floor until they stretch out the backside of their pelvis and be able to get into a position where these tissues can elongate and then they can internally rotate their pelvis, which is this action right here. Again, I'm exaggerating how much is happening here. So what we're gonna do here is get in a position where we can get far enough away from the wall where we have a slight bend in our elbows. We can feel our whole hands flat on that wall. We also have our knees hip width apart and directly underneath our hips. Now, what's important here is we're going to very slowly walk our hands down that wall until we feel the slightest stretch in the back of our hips, our glute area. And we need to maintain a neutral spine as we do that. So we're not going to be overly crunched nor overly extended. We should be a little bit flat right here. And then because you're just very slightly reaching through the wall, there might be a tiny bit of curvature right here. But the important thing is that your sternum is not depressed. We never want to do that. We have our head in a neutral position. So we have alignment in our spine. All you're going to do here is breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, nice and controlled. About a five second, soft, chill exhale through the mouth. And then we're going to close our mouth, put our tongue on the roof of the mouth and inhale through the nose silently for about three to five seconds. Let's say you feel pretty good in that position. Now is the progression. What you could do is slowly walk down a little bit more until you feel just the tiniest bit more of a glute stretch. This is about, again, no more than about a three to five out of 10. And you're just going to sit there and breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth in that position. Once you can get low like this, you're probably ready for the full wall walk down hinge variation or wall walk down squat. A common mistake on this activity is people are going to lose the position of their head, which is going to cause them to overly flex or extend the spine. So a good cue is just keep your eyes in between your hands, looking at sort of the thumb line. And as you walk down, that'll ensure that your head is in a good position. Remember, as we go into this internally rotated position, these bones rotate in, the front side of our pelvic floor is in more of a shortened position, the back side is in more of a lengthened position. So we need to get stuff on the front side to activate, and that will help facilitate the opening and backing of this space to decompress. And here's a really good exercise to do that. What we're gonna do is get our feet on the wall, and ideally for most people, they're gonna have a shelf underneath them of some sort. So you could use something like this DC block, you could use a bench, uh, you could use whatever you need to stack up as long as you can still maintain your whole foot flat on the wall. That's gonna be the important part there because we need foot contacts on the wall. Those foot contacts are the inner heel and the first metatarsal head on both sides evenly. That doesn't mean we lose the outside foot, that just means that's where our bias is. Now, we're also gonna have an object in between our knees. And this object needs to be a little bit compressible, so that way when we squeeze it, our knees very slightly move in. But we also don't want the object to be so large that in the starting position, our knees are outside of our hips, so they're wide like that. It should be, we're starting pretty in line with our feet and our hips. And now what we're gonna do, keeping our hands on our low ribs and our chin directly at the ceiling, we're going to do a little posterior pelvic tilt. And we're gonna do that by dragging our feet down into that shelf or down on that wall, but they're not obviously going to move. It's the intention of dragging our heels down, which is going to lift our tailbone off of the floor. And as we do that, we're going to feel our hamstrings engage on both sides relatively evenly. Our low back remains flat. So that's all we're feeling right now is hamstrings. After you have that, you're going to squeeze the ball. 
And for this, you're gonna squeeze it a decent bit. On a scale of one to 10, you're looking at about somewhere between a five to seven out of 10. Not to the point where you're shaking or you're sweating, just enough to kind of feel your inner thigh muscles working on both sides. So make sure you don't lose your hamstrings when you get that squeeze. And then you're just going to inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, softly sigh all the air out. You're going to be very tempted to tense other things up in your body as you do this, such as your neck, such as your calves, such as your abs, but you wanna make sure that nothing is engaging other than your hamstrings and your inner thigh muscles. The only exception to that could be a little bit of your side abs at the end of the exhale. But as long as you're isolating those muscles, you're doing a really good job. The most common mistake on this is people are gonna lift their hips too high in the air, and that is not what we want. We want the tailbone to be slightly lifted off of the floor, but not the low back. So it's important that you just do a little bit of a tilt and then engage with the squeeze. Depending on you as an individual, you may want to add a little support underneath your neck, like a towel rolled up. Just make sure that it's only as thick to the point where you feel like your neck is supported and your chin is passively pointing straight up at the ceiling. You don't ever want to do this where it's so thick and it's tilted back or it's collapsing down. Now the breathing is imperative here because remember, these diaphragms are oftentimes in a position of inhalation where they're descended. Now we want to ascend them, which is a position of exhalation, so we need to make sure we're fully breathing through it. Make sure that's key and locked in, in your mind, because if it's not, you're not gonna get nearly as much out of these exercises. I recommend doing these exercises every day for about two sets of five slow breath cycles. Emphasizing the breath cycles and not time because that will allow you to really focus on the things that matter, which is the full inhalation and exhalation. I would do that ideally in a perfect world in both the morning and at night, two sets of five breaths in the order that you've seen them in this video. But if not, at least doing it once per day will be very helpful.